At any rate, I'm glad you showed up so I could have the opportunity to revisit these events that span the whole of my lifetime thus far and speak about what has been my passion and most dear to me. I'm sitting here in my friend Matt's studio, and he's going to record this for me so I don't screw it up again. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell you right up front the whole of what I've discovered in one sentence. There is absolutely nothing here, and everything is proof of it. <laughs> That's it. A whole lifetime of searching and finding culminates in that one phrase, a paradox. I've ended up with a paradox, finding myself to be a negation that affirms everything to be that very negation. It's an affirmative negation. What I came to find in 57 years of contemplating, digging, and searching reveal this whole show we call life and the universe in which it appears to all be imagination, if looked upon as something other than myself. If I look upon it as myself, then all of it is real, or the real. I ended up finding no seeker, nor anything to seek, nor anything to find or recognize. I can't say what it is that I am, but it is without a doubt, without a blemish, and is the constant and changeless essence and identity of the ever-changing life I seem to be participating in. I found we need not acquire anything or relinquish anything to be what we couldn't possibly escape. What I've come to find through all my seeking and finding culminates in the whole of existence to be a mirage from one viewpoint and reality from another. Now, what is a mirage? It's something that appears to be there but isn't. There is a Hindu saying that captures what I'm speaking of beautifully. It reads, The world is illusion. Only Brahman is real. The world is Brahman. When I first read this, it was such a joyful confirmation. This is exactly what I had come to recognize. The world I see now, I see in the same way I've always seen it. Only now the world is recognized to be what I am. The world reflects my identity back to me. Without the mirage or the world, I couldn't have come to this recognition. No mirage, no recognition. Without the sense of the doer or duality, there is no sense of unity or singular identity. Even this recognition of everything being myself is really a mirage too. As you'll later hear, it certainly wasn't a relief at the onset of recognizing these things. It was a shock to find myself and the universe to have never existed. It is an acquired taste for sure. All the intuitive perceptive shifts I'm going to talk about ended up revealing that existence and non-existence are not only ideas but are impossibilities. I'm not saying one should throw the world away, but when one recognizes the world to be one's vacuous consciousness and identity, the world no longer holds up as something other than one's own essence and quintessence, which is found to be totally void of objectivity and subjectivity. I don't expect you to understand what I'm talking about, and there's no way under the sun I can prove a single thing I'm telling you. There is no scientific proof for anything I've got to say because what I've recognized myself to be can't be measured or detected by any instrument or calculated by any mathematical equation. What I'm talking about has nothing to do with belief. It's my direct experience. I don't expect anyone to buy into my story, and I sure wouldn't have bought into it myself if someone had told me this 41 years ago. All these revelations I'm going to speak of have come via intuitive shifts in perception. Each one was spontaneous, sudden, and nothing shy of a gift. No matter the conceptual understanding I gained through reading the words of others, it always took an intuitive shift in perception before there was any real understanding or apprehension. Just saying. I've tried to share this gift 
and find over the years with a few folks, and I'm looked upon as a crazy man, a lunatic. That's why I just go around from day to day here in the Bible Belt, taking care of what needs tending to, and mixing and mingling with folks when necessary, and keeping my mouth shut about this matter. I have no bodhisattva inclinations of saving the world and those in it. The world and all those walking on it are already what I am, and there's not a spot or blemish to be found with what I am or what I view. I didn't seek the truth to save the world, but I did find it already saved in the moment I recognized my true identity. So what I've come to find myself to be is what you are and what everything is, and I can't tell you what that is. All I can say is that it is for sure, and I am it. And it is not even an it. So I'm completely unknowable, and unknown is something. Yet, I remain unbroken, even in deep sleep. I didn't come from anywhere. I ain't going anywhere. And I'm not anywhere in particular at this moment. I'm really not void, nor am I not void. Nor any condition nameable. And that includes the condition of conditionless. I'm not extinct, yet I am extinct of any relative quality, including peace, love, bliss, or any such tomfoolery. Nothing at all applies to me, yet I remain as the quintessence of everything. I'm not light or darkness. I am that I am, and I couldn't possibly know what I am because I'm unknowable and prior to lateral knowledge of any sort. So all you peace seekers are out of luck if you're looking to this talk to help you find solace in a transient state of relative peace that is not totally with you and as you at this very moment. As far as I'm concerned, there is the recognition of peace with this, finally. But it is abiding and beyond any conceptual understanding or acquisition. It is constant and changeless and not subject to be threatened, nor is it wavering. Now I'm going to recount my dream story and findings while I can still remember them, but I'm telling you right up front, the whole charade I'm about to spit out really never happened, nor did it even not happen. I'm still apparently playing the human being game while at the same time not participating, and I am beyond certain that none of this is really happening. As far as my findings go, we already know what we are, and it's already right out in the wide open in plain view. But we need an intuitive shift in perception to recognize it. All of this seeking business is just a scary dream that'll finally evaporate in time, along with time. In the words of the great Wei Lang, who lived in the 6th century and became the 6th patriarch, he said, From the very beginning, there never has been a single thing. Ah, oh, yes, I concur. This one phrase won him the robe and bowl from the 5th patriarch. But this not a single thing he is making reference to is what is peering out of your eyes right now, and is surely a marvel beyond description when it's apprehended. Ah, it's really a magnificent find and definitely an acquired taste after thinking oneself is a minute speck in a universe so big that it can never be mentally or physically fathomed. I'd also like to add before I get started, this is only my story and I don't expect anyone else's story to tally with mine. I discovered these things alone and without the help of anyone that I could talk to about it. There was no one to talk to about this matter around my neck of the woods. I was raised in the country as a farm boy right out in the heart of the Bible Belt where all I heard about was hell, fire, and brimstone. No gurus around here, at least none that I knew about. My teachers were the sun, moon, stars, dirt, wind, trees, and critters, 
All of them were preaching the truth of what I am always. The human beings I was exposed to were always teaching me what I am not. So the teachers were there, but it took me a long time to recognize them as teachers and what they were ceaselessly trying to show me. My greatest teacher was with me always, my true self. In the early days, I referred to that teacher as God. I didn't know for a long time that God and I were inseparable and that there was no God really, nor was there really a me either. I felt alone and forsaken for what seemed to be an eternity. Although I felt this presence, I called God very near, I felt alone. I didn't realize this aloneness would reveal itself to be what I was looking for, to be the singular identity and essence of all. I had no Eastern philosophy books to read for a long time, thank goodness, or I may have never found my way. I have no hero complex about walking this trek alone, but I mentioned the solitary trek because I'd like to say what we are can be recognized no matter where you are or what your life condition happens to be. I might also add there is one outstanding feature that came with each and every one of these perceptual shifts that I came upon and will talk about, and that is each shift revealed an intuitive insight of something about myself that was already in place and right out in the wide open. I never once came upon anything new or unusual. Each discovery was a matter of fact. Not from the beginning... Have I ever attained anything? Each shift in perception allowed an intuitive view of something about myself that I had always known, but wasn't conscious of being conscious of. Each shift afforded a view of something about myself I'd been overlooking, something that the birds, trees, bugs, and the wind had been coaxing me to see all along. If I were asked what the main ingredient is to finding out what you are, I'd say desperate earnestness is the key. That's the catalyst that'll take you all the way to recognition and acclamation. But this is an organic factor. Desperate earnestness is not something one acquires. It seems to be a terrible vexation that comes upon one to where nothing in life can satisfy except to get at the truth at any cost. As far as I can tell, this is no path for casual intrigue. It has been terribly demanding and has stretched me mentally, emotionally, and physically beyond the limits of what I thought I could endure. It hasn't been a one-and-done event either. It has taken a whole lifetime of constant pursuit, devotion, and attention. But make no mistake, I'm speaking about a phenomenal set of events that never happened as anything less than a dream. A most marvelous and beneficial and terrifying dream, but at any rate, only a dream at best. Definition of Terms I need to define some terms that I'll be using to describe the three intuitive shifts of identification I've encountered. The first thing I need to do is to define what I mean when I say intuitive shift in perception. Now, I'll bet sometime in your life you've been exposed to a stereogram. You know, it's a piece of paper with a whole bunch of dots on it. And that's what, that's what it looks like, just a paper with dots on it. But someone says, there's an image of a rabbit in those dots. And at first glance, you don't see the image of the rabbit. So you keep on focusing your eyes in different ways until, bingo, the image of the rabbit appears. Now, this is an intuitive shift. This is a great metaphor for self-discovery. As in the stereogram, the rabbit was there all the time, but you couldn't see it at first. But it was there the whole time. After seeing it, you can't not see it. So this account that I'm giving of my quest is only a pointing towards angles of perception that you must apprehend for yourself. You'll have to apprehend them through intuitive, perceptive shifts of your own. 
All I'm doing is telling you there is a rabbit within those dots that you'll have to discover for yourself. Three angles of perception. There are three distinct angles of perception that I've discovered so far that make up my singular nature. There must be intuitive shifts in perception for these to be recognized. You can conceptualize about them till the land looks level, but until the intuitive shifts occur, you ain't going to have a clue as to what I'm talking about. I find that I'm a singular fact, and it is a multidimensional fact, if you will, a trinity. As one whole, I refer to myself as the triune self, which is the doer, absolute consciousness, and absolute identity. All three of these at once. I came upon these three different angles of perception one at a time. Nowadays, the three angles of perception have interfaced or homogenized into one conscious experience. The three are one, and they've always been one. It's just plain old me. No bells, no whistles, nothing special, or nothing holy. Here they are spelled out. Number one, the doer idea. This is the fallacious idea that I am an independent and individual entity with a free will. This is the limited sense of I and is very important to be seen for what it is and used for what it is. Some schools of thought teach that this is the ego and it is to be gotten rid of. I couldn't disagree more. This very sense of I that you sense and feel right at this very instant is your true quintessential identity and essence, only identifying in a limited way. This I is the truth right now the supreme reality. Yes, your right now I is the same I you have always identified as all of your life. It has never changed, nor could it. Without this sense of a separate I, there would be no me and you. There would be no conversation and no world, nor would there be any experience, for there would be no duality or experience here. But this particular I sense is certainly not the whole picture. As for my findings, the doer sense starts to identify differently as the intuitive shifts in perception occur. Now, I'm not going to bash the teaching community much, but i got to point out one proclamation that I've heard more than once, which can be very misleading to one trying to get on to who and what they are. These accounts you've heard about of those enlightened people saying that their sense of I went away and never came back is just a bunch of bullshit as far as I'm concerned. Let's look at this unfounded proclamation. Who says my sense of I went away? Who says it? Do you understand? Again, who says my I sense went away? Now, this means something didn't go away. And that something that didn't go away is my, which is the same self I that they just proclaimed went away. I'll say it again a little differently. My sense of self went away. That is the self, the supreme reality, saying itself went away. I hope you are not paying these people money to lead you into a ditch. Look, nothing about you goes away, okay? If it can go away, it was never there in the first place. All right, that's the end of the guru bashing. Now, granted... I'll agree that the solid sense of an I may have been found to be void of any solidity or validity as something or someone. But this separate sense of I they are speaking of that went away 
didn't go away or they wouldn't even be conscious to talk about it. The I that registers the sense of limitation is already and always not limited and doesn't change or go away when it's found that it's never existed as an independent entity. Also, the world doesn't go away either when you find it out to be totally empty and void of one atom. The atoms remain just as they were, only now they're found to be purely phenomenal and illusory as something other than oneself. The world remains when you recognize your true essence and quintessence, and so does the doer idea. So this is the good news. You don't have to or need to try to get rid of yourself. You're only seeking to find out what you really are beyond all the misconceptions built up over your lifetime or apparent lifetimes. But here's another disclaimer. You can't conceptually ever know what you really are because you find yourself to be unknowable and unknown. You can intuit being unknowable and unknown. I'm beyond certain of that. But you can't know it as something or a concept. In order for what we are to be recognized, there has to be a series of intuitive shifts in perception for this to be apprehended. At least this has been my experience with it. No amount of conceptualization ever did me any good. No amount of sitting around with my eyes closed in meditation, trying to be still, ever did me any good in trying to resolve this conundrum. The terrific need to know the truth seemed to make the way clear for these spontaneous shifts in intuitive perception to occur. So, I never willfully made one of them happen by practicing anything. All my practicing ended in failure to achieve. Each shift into clearer vision was a gift that followed total failure to achieve. Like the rabbit in the stereogram, you can't force him into recognition. When you do recognize him, it is a gift, and it is all at once and final. But if you don't try to see him, you probably ain't going to see him. So... <laughs> It seems to take a lot of straining and struggling to find what's already in place, and that's what the intuitive shifts are about. I can stand flat-footed and tell you I never made any of the shift in perception happen for myself. Each one came spontaneously out of nowhere. Each one was sudden and final. Now, getting acclimated to them after their revelation was surely not sudden or final. It's taken years and years. And today, I'm only a beginner when it comes to fathoming what has been revealed. With each passing moment of each passing day, I become more acclimated to the revelatory intuitive shifts that occurred over the years. I don't see any end to recognizing what they have to offer. For how could one ever hope to fathom the infinite, effulgent voidness of absolute consciousness? Next term up is... Absolute consciousness. This will be old number two here. Now, you may be wondering, why is he using the term absolute in front of the term consciousness? I use it because I don't want anyone to think I'm talking about consciousness, meaning wakened consciousness, or like he lost consciousness, or when I regain consciousness. I'm using the term consciousness to mean the absolute essence of everything, from thoughts, emotions, energy, atoms, world, universe, or anything imaginable or unimaginable. Consciousness is the singular essence of all. Consciousness is the all. Besides it, there is no other. So we are putting anything and everything under this umbrella. This is why I use the term absolute consciousness. This term refers to my beingness and the self-same beingness of not only myself, 
but the singular, all-encompassing, and all-inclusive void beingness or intelligence of everything. Even awareness is a product of absolute consciousness. I like to call it beingness because I can feel, sense, beingness. And I figure you can too. I mean, how could you miss it? It's radiating from you right now as you, right here in this moment. It is effulgent, visceral, radiant, and absolutely void of any objectivity or subjectivity whatsoever. Absolute consciousness, as I'm using the term, is the great void. You may have heard about or somewhere along the way in, in your reading or whatever. The great void. Some refer to it as awareness. That's fine too. But the way I'm using it, and the way I like to talk about it, I prefer beingness. When one has the intuitive shift of actually being this vacuous beingness, they may try to articulate it as no self, since it is empty of content. One may say, after recognizing this, Oh, I am nothingness. I never existed as a someone or somebody. Yea, I have always been this of this void effulgence and that it, it's empty of content and it's constant. There is no me in here. I never have been bound. I'm freedom itself. Yea, I have found it. It isn't this exciting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a great find, all right, but give it a few days or weeks to sink in. Just wait until this emptiness really hits home and you can't find yourself. You can't find yourself to be anything at all, not even a witness. Try finding the witness. When it really strikes home that there is no one in there and never was, that yippy, yummy business of emptiness all changes then. But let's look at what has happened here. All it really amounts to is a change in identification. So nothing really has changed except the way one identifies. One goes from thinking of oneself a solid and individual entity to discovering through an intuitive perceptive shift there is nothing solid about oneself. He finds himself to be vacuous, emptiness, with no locus. It's been this way all the time, only now one recognizes it to be the fact, and a fact that he can't even deny. After this intuitive perceptual shift has occurred, the doer has recognized his real true voidness, all right, but it may still be an object to him. He is still in view of it, even though he can feel it to be his true essence. At this point, it is a void effulgence the doer is associating with. But when this voidness starts to claim the doer, the roles are starting to be reversed, and this can scare the living shit out of the doer. Instead of the doer being conscious of his voidness, the roles flip-flop and the voidness becomes aware of the doer. So the doer finds himself to actually be voidness and this can take some getting used to. Nothing has really changed except how the doer is identifying. The doer sense didn't disappear. This angle of perception must remain if one is to function in the world of polar opposites. Nothing has fallen off nor gone away. The identification has only morphed. The whole time it is only you making the transition from identifying in the old way to the new way. This is a hell of a transition and shift of identification. There ain't anything yummy about this, or at least it wasn't in my case. The doer idea suffers an existential death 
and is reborn into being the all instead of an individual unit aware of the all. This is a good example of the acclimation process I mentioned earlier that has gone along with these intuitive perceptual shifts that I've encountered. After finding oneself to be absolute consciousness, there is the possibility one can have another shift in perception to where they intuitively sense their self-same void beingness to actually be everything they register through their senses. At this point, they have come upon what I call unity consciousness, or oneness. They are one with everything imaginable. It makes no difference if it is animate, inanimate, alive, or dead, benevolent, or malevolent. This unity is all-inclusive. These two shifts in perception can happen individually as two separate events or can occur simultaneously as one singular event. But again, nothing has changed except the way the doer is identifying with his environment. Nothing has fallen off or gone away. One may fall in love with everything when this shift occurs, but that ain't going to last because it's one-sided. Now, just as soon as someone kicks you in the nuts or steals your car or both, that cotton candy love will fly right out the window and you'll be wondering what happened to your enlightenment. You'll be introduced to real love, but will you notice it? Will you be acclimated and seasoned enough to recognize love then? That's a different animal altogether. Love, as far as I'm concerned, is recognizing oneself to be everything, no matter what it is or how it shows up. And that includes hate. Nothing is left out. No holes barred. I ain't got any patience with the glassy-eyed, gooey, one-sided spiritual or religious version of love preached from the pulpit. It's fake and contrived. To recognize all of it to be what I am, be it gentle or rough, loving or hateful, and to be clear enough to love or hate anything and everything without a second thought or running anything through filters, that's love to me. I've noticed a few times I've been around seekers, they seem to have an inflated, unfounded notion of how someone should conduct themselves after self-recognition. If they had the opportunity to hang out with such a person for a few days, they might be surprised and shocked at how normal they are. This person still gets pissed off and angry, just like anyone else, except he doesn't have a self-judgmental filter of guilt. He can be spontaneous without recourse to guilt. He chews tobacco, drinks beer, and rye whiskey. He eats all different kinds of meat and curses like a sailor. <laughs> There's no specific way one acts after self-recognition. These people you see trying to put on a spiritual image, you might ought to steer clear of them. So... Absolute consciousness for me is the heart and soul of Advaita Vedanta, or non-dual awareness, which includes positive as well as negative. It can be said to be the benevolent and the malevolent, both and neither, and beyond both and neither. This non-dual awareness has no qualities, but it is the source and essence of all qualities, without itself being a quality. I like the goal metaphor when talking about this angle of perception. It doesn't make any difference what kind of ornament you make out of gold. The gold is always gold without being any ornament. No matter what shape the gold is fashioned into, it remains itself gold, pure and untainted. Gold has no original shape. The shape it is fashioned into has no effect on its gold nature. Same goes with absolute consciousness. It is what everything really is, and it is totally extinct of any quality, yet 
is the sum total of all qualities. Next up is number three, absolute identity. Now again, I'm using the term absolute in front of identity for a reason. Your name may be Mary, and Mary is your relative identity amongst your fellow human race. But what was Mary's identity before she was given the name Mary? That identity is what I'm referring to. Your identity before there was a universe. That's the identity I'm speaking of. In deep sleep, what is your identity? What is your name then? Absolute identity is not about your relative identity, but it's not different from your relative identity either. That identity that identifies with the name Mary is it. The sense of I without a relative name is what I'm talking about. And this identity can be intuited to be the identity of everything, including absolute consciousness, with the help of an intuitive shift in perception. This angle of perception leaves me with very few words to point it out. This is my true identity, or in Zen, original face. It is the authority and author of my everyday me, or I. It is the identity of my I, the I of the I. The only qualitative terms that even come close to describing it is authoritative immediacy, glass-breaking immediacy, that is authorship. Absolute identity is the identity of absolute consciousness as well as the identity of the doer idea. Same identity, same authorship. This was my first intuitive shift that came after 34 years of seeking. Had I come upon absolute consciousness first, you probably wouldn't have never been able to convince me there was anything else or any other angle of perception. I've already experienced the futility of trying to point this out to those whom have come upon absolute consciousness first. It ain't nothing but a waste of time. So to try and make a simple distinction between the two angles of perception of consciousness and identity, I'll just pick something simple and keep it simple. If you don't have a pencil handy, just use your imagination and visualize one in your head. Now, you're looking at the pencil. If you're on to the recognition of absolute consciousness, to the point of actually sensing your true essence to be everything, you can view the pencil and immediately sense, feel your unity with it. Its essence or beingness is your essence or beingness. You are one with the pencil. You are the pencil, and the pencil is you. You are the same essence. There really is no two. After it is recognized that oneness is only an idea or condition, one can clearly see that there really is no oneness with absolute consciousness because there is no two-ness to become oneness. Absolute consciousness is just that. It's absolute, and there is nothing but it. This is my experience as absolute consciousness. Now take the same pencil and look at it. And just as soon as you recognize it as an object, you recognize your very identity to be reflected back at you. This is immediate and self-evident as my experience. Oneness is my experience is like radiance. But identity is immediate authorship. You can actually recognize your identity as the pencil or in the pencil. It's the same identity as yours. Right now, your right now, every day identity. This is what I'm referring to as absolute identity. Which ends up being the heart of Zen. The crack of a whip, the strike of lightning, authority, identity, everything mirrors my identity, my original nameless name, my original 
faceless face. So now that we have the definitions of terms all out of the way, I'm going to tell my story about how I came about discovering my triune self. So, here we go. Becoming conscious of being conscious. I'll start out by telling you the seeking began, in my case, in the baby bed, when the I thought emerged out of nowhere. My first major shift was when I became conscious of being conscious in a baby bed. It was like a switch being flipped on. I arrived from where I didn't know. The question never came up. I arrived out of the darkness of my natural home into the light of waking consciousness. I didn't seem to be shaken, nor was it unusual to be identified as a someone at that time of arrival. There wasn't even anything new or out of the ordinary about it for me. It wasn't like I'd been dropped into some new weird dimension. I wasn't new or old. I was just conscious of being conscious. I was okay. I remember my clothing. A navy blue pair of overalls with a white shirt. There was a light blue baby bottle laying on my shoulder. This must have been some time before I was walking. When I arrived, I was looking at the wall across the room. It was pink and the ceiling was white. These sights were not unfamiliar to me. I must have been registering them subconsciously for some time before being conscious of being conscious. Also, as I described these colors, I had no such concepts as pink or blue, but I was aware of color just as I am now. Only now I have concepts to label them. At this point, I had no name, no thought process, and no agenda. I was just conscious, and I knew I was conscious. For a long time, I didn't know why I remembered this moment, but the memory of it would become significant later on. There's a verse in the New Testament. It's Matthew chapter 19, verse 14. Jesus said, Suffer the little children and forbid them not to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven he's referring to was with me and as me as an infant, unrecognized. I must recognize it, and that's what my story is about. I did I didn't know that it was going to take a lifetime to get back to that very moment in the baby bed and appreciate it for what it was. That which became conscious in the baby bed is what's talking to you right now. It hadn't learned a thing, hadn't forgotten anything, made any progress, nor has it been liberated from anything, for it's never been bound. That which arrived and became conscious of being conscious in the baby bed was completely whole and without a stain or blemish, just as it is right now talking to you. At this point, I was just conscious of being me looking at my surroundings. I do remember there being a longing with me from the very beginning. It came with the program of being conscious. For all I know, this may be the case for everyone. I wasn't aware of what the longing was about until later on, but it was definitely with me when I arrived. As I grew, a loneliness and longing for divine union, which was already in place, would grow as I grew. This was with me right from the very first moment of identified consciousness. It would remain with me until today and drive me to find my true essence and identity. So I started seeking when I first became conscious of identified consciousness. I showed up seeking. I had to get a few years under my belt and develop physically and mentally before going after this quest could formulate. 
I had the sense of something greater than my personal self with me early on, before I got indoctrinated into the religious dogma, and felt something near, a presence very near, visceral and available. But I just didn't know how to get at it. I remember lying under the pine trees as a young feller, about seven or eight years old, looking up through the pine needles and at the sky with the white clouds floating by and wondering, what am I missing? What am I not seeing? There was a longing to join somehow. There was something so near, but just out of reach, yet right here with me. I had heard the concept of a male God when I was young, since my mother would make me and my younger brother go to church. I didn't have any trouble believing in God. It made sense to me. I could look around and see that I didn't really know what anything was, and for sure I didn't create anything. Somebody must have created it, because it sure wasn't me. But what they were saying in church about God didn't make any sense to me. The preachers would scream and holler and get red in the face and talk about me going to hell if I didn't do God's will and if I didn't accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior and all that. It just never made any sense to me. I, I felt God to be at hand and never felt him to be judgmental towards me. I felt like he created me, and if he did, he must surely love me and watch out for me. I started longing to know him and to find out what our relationship was as I continued to grow up. As I gained the power of common logic and reasoning, I began to put two and two together. And what the preachers were saying about God wasn't adding up at all. It just wasn't true for me. It couldn't be true because it was a total contradiction. They would say, God loves you, but he will send you to hell for eternity if you don't do what he says. Bullshit. I ain't believing that. The sermons I was hearing were not helping me know God. They were putting a wall up between me and him. I had come to recognize these bastards didn't know what they were talking about, and I was going to have to do something else if I was going to get to the bottom of this. So I started looking for another way. When I was the age of 16, I'd put together emotionally and logically that I was going to have to find God on my own if this longing was to ever go away or be satiated. So one night, I was walking across the living room floor, and there was an inner voice that said, with authority, go read the Bible. So I did. I just happened to have one that was given to me by my Sunday school teacher. Had my name on it and everything. It was the King James Version. I was enamored with the Jesus story that I'd been hearing about all along. So I started with the New Testament. I had already decided the common belief system around the community was off the mark. So I decided to read it with fresh eyes and try to get to the bottom of what it was talking about. I could feel there was something true about the words of Jesus, but I didn't really know what it was. There was something about the story that rang true, though. The story, when I read it, didn't have anything to do with what I'd heard from the pulpit or in Sunday school class. What was most striking about the story was here was a man claiming to know his divinity without a shadow of a doubt. I felt like he had recognized what I was starving to know. It was evident to me that the religious community had made an idol out of Jesus and had totally missed the meaning of his message. Something was terribly wrong with what I'd been told about the man and his message. So I decided that I was going to find out what he knew. It made no difference the price I had to pay nor how long it took. I was going to have to go against convention, though. I was going to have to strike out into the unknown alone and find something that no one in my surroundings understood or could help me with. I felt like I could get it some way if I tried hard enough. But I felt like 
I could get into some serious trouble messing with it. But I had to know. There, I just, there wasn't any choice left but to find out. I didn't feel like God would condemn me to hell if I was doing the best I could to try to get to him. And I was going to get to him even if it killed me. I had done decided if it did kill me, I'd just come back and let it kill me as many times as it took to get to it. When I made this commitment, I was visited with my first encounter of real fear. I didn't know at the time what this fear was about, but I do now. There's a Bible verse that reads, For whoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. In other words, I ended up finding out for myself, if you're going to find out for yourself what Jesus had realized and was pointing towards, you will surely lose your life as you know it. And oh Lord, how true those words ended up being. This fear is the fear of losing one's idea of themselves as they find out the truth of themselves. The whole of it, as far as I'm concerned, is only a perceptive correction of identification. I mean, you just end up recognizing yourself to not be a little insignificant human being that is subject to birth and death. You find yourself to be the whole truth itself, which is timeless, spaceless, and eternal. You find yourself to be nothing at all that is nameable or knowable. This is a tall order to comprehend when you think yourself to be a minute little human being in a vast and scary universe. So the correction of identification happens when one's perception is shifted from being separate to being the singular essence and identity of all. And so for this to happen, at least in my case, there was the experience of death many times as I would be born again into clearer view and experiences until the whole thing collapsed into the recognition that the whole of it was nothing more than a dream that never even happened. In my case, there have been many experiences of death, so so many that I actually got to be friends with death. So the way I articulate it, this fear is really the fear of God, the fear of being God, or the source of everything, or whatever you want to call it. It's the great existential death that we pass through on the way to discovering we aren't anything nameable or locatable. The death of the egocentric separate doer or doer idea as being a real or solid entity is really all this death is about. This fear for me was the beginning of the dark night of the soul that John of the Cross spoke of. The dark night of the soul ended up lasting decades in my case I suffered dying for it seemed like an eternity, moment to moment, day after day, and year after year. It made no sense to me that I'd be suffering fear when I was reaching for the highest goal imaginable. I didn't understand why God was letting this go on while I was so earnestly devoted to finding Him. But I figured He knew what He was doing. At least one of us knew what they were doing. Besides, I was already committed to stay in the course at any price, even unto death. You know, I had already somehow known intuitively that this very venture was why I was born. This was what all the constant nagging, longing, and all the discomfort had been about my whole life. And I really had no other choice but to find out what I was looking for. And I really didn't know what it was that I was looking for. I could feel it near, but I didn't know what it was. And it seems crazy to be seeking something that you don't even know what you're seeking. I didn't know what I was looking for. 
and what it was going to look like when I found it. All I knew to call it was God. I didn't have a preconceived notion of what God looked like, but I didn't think of him to be a bearded old man with a tablet taking down names and getting ready to kick ass when I died. No, I wasn't under that assumption at all, even though I'd been taught that my whole life. Whatever he was, however he appeared, I somehow knew him to be true and good. Something I could know. And I had the feeling he was going to reveal himself to me if I'd just keep on trying to get at him. The New Testament reads, Seek and ye shall find, knock and it shall be opened to you. Somewhere in me I felt that to be true. And I kept that verse in mind all the way. Prayer seemed to be my constant state, even when I wasn't conscious of it. I prayed a lot. I prayed, Lord, please show me how to get to you. Show me the way. Let me see and know the truth. Something was brought up about praying one time at the dinner table, and I remember hearing my granddaddy say, you don't have to keep on repeating a prayer over and over. God hears you the first time, so ask it once and let it be. If you believe he heard it and that he's going to answer it, then wait for him to answer it and leave off the vain repetitions. Now that right there felt right to me. So I mostly felt the prayer instead of repeating a bunch of words. This way I was in constant prayer. I had asked to be shown the way and I felt certain that I was going to be shown, whatever that way was. My prayer was like a receptive reaching without words. So the Bible was pretty much all I had of any real value to read from my 16th year until I was 33 years old. Each day I watched and waited to be answered. Days turned into years. 17 years is a long time to suffer and wait on God to answer. But I never gave up on him. I figured maybe he was making me ready in some way. Hope. Hope was all I had. The suffering really wasn't all that bad up to this point because I wasn't wanting to know the truth for any favors such as the relief of suffering. I only wanted to know the truth firsthand, and if suffering was what it took, then so be it. The Shift of Absolute Identity The Course in Miracles when I was coming up on 33 years old, I'd been reading on the Bible and contemplating God for 17 years without a sign of any breakthrough. But that's all fixing to change. I was walking through the living room one day and Oprah Winfrey was playing on the TV. and Deepak Chopra was Oprah's guest and I'd never heard of him and I sure hadn't heard of what he was talking about either. But what he was saying caught my ear. He was talking about Eastern philosophy. So I sat down and listened. I thought, now this is different. This is more like it. He's talking about what I'm looking for in a whole different way. Something about what he was saying was music to my ears. So I went right to the bookstore the next time I was in Nashville and looked up some of his material. I bought a cassette tape of his and listened to it. He made reference to A Course in Miracles a couple of times. I thought to myself, that's what I need right there. I need a miracle. I had seemingly made no progress all these years, and I needed a miracle of some kind to break through. So I found out where to order the course from, and I bought the whole thing, including it on cassette tape so I could listen to it driving down the road. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Course in Miracles, it's a 365-day course that is supposed to have been channeled by Jesus through a woman who was an atheist of all, all things. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that ought to have been enough right there to run me off. But uh, I know it sounds weird, but uh, I was desperate. So I needed some sort of 
help, and I was willing to try anything to get it. So, one redeeming quality about it, though, is Jesus had a hand in it. I, I trusted him. At this point, the only two that I knew of up to this particular point in my life, the only two authorities that I even trusted in my quest was God and Jesus, and they weren't talking. So uh, this was a major step for me to look at something written down other than the Bible. I was more than a little apprehensive about the course, so I prayed about it. I said, Lord, if this ain't right, if it's a fake, let me know and I won't mess with it. And I got kind of an intuitive nudge to go forth with it. So I went right on into it. This was the spring of my 32nd year, right before turning 33. The first thing I read in the course was, Nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. Huh. I read that a few times over and scratched my head. And I thought, well, I got a hold of something here that I'm not going to be able to understand. I remember I, this does seem right. I don't know what it means, but I'm fixing to find out. And I got to tell you, I, I didn't understand anything I was reading as I went along in The Course in Miracles. And what I thought that I sort of grasped was really disturbing to me. Again, I would ask, is this right for me, Lord? And again, I would get an intuitive nudge to keep going with it. After a couple of times of praying about it, I quit worrying and just went went on and did what it prescribed. According to the Course, it says that anything that threatens to reveal the fallacious ego will feel threatening, and it was right. The Course in Miracles does a thorough job of calling out the ego and its illusory nature. The whole time I was studying it, it was causing anxiety within me. The feel of the whole thing was threatening. But I was ready to suffer some kind of existential death if I had to, to get it to truth in the process. So I carried on with the Course in Miracles, doing the daily affirmations during the day, and listening to the abstract text as I was driving back and forth to my job, where I was playing music and entertaining folks three shows a day while playing the Grand Ole Opry on the weekends and doing matinees during the week. I would also sometimes get on an airplane with my band and fly out to do county fairs and private uh, corporate shows and things of that nature. I'd fly back to Nashville and that night and be back at Opera Land the next morning. I was working the park six days a week three shows a day during the spring, summer, and fall seasons, along with all these other shows as I was doing The Course in Miracles. Nothing could get in my way. I, I did The Course to the letter as best as I could while performing over 650 shows that year. I'm grateful I had this hectic schedule to wear off the anxious energy of trying to get it to truth. I was in the prime of life. And I was getting ready to meet God. I had energy to burn, baby, because I really felt like I was on the cusp of finding what I've been longing for all my life. The angst that went along with doing the course miracles let up some as I went along and accepted the fact that I didn't and couldn't understand anything I was reading or doing with the course. But the course made it very plain that it wasn't important to understand the words. It made it clear that to do what it said was what was important, whether or not you understood it or not. It's kind of funny in retrospect. I, I didn't know this until after the fact, but I found you can't understand the Bible or the Course in Miracles until it's too late. You can't understand it, any of the masters before it's too late. <laughs> I found out that lateral conceptual knowledge ain't got a thing to do with what I am and what I was seeking. All the words can do is point towards the truth. 
I didn't have anyone to tell me this, so I had to find it out through the school of hard knocks on my own. I was coming up on the end of the course, and there was a feeling that something was going to happen as I got close to the end of it, the end of the 365-day course. I didn't know what, but I sure felt there was something fixing to happen. I had it all worked out to have the text read or listened to along with the manual for teachers by the time I finished the 365-day three, the course. So I finished it with great anticipation. I could feel and sense something was going to happen. I was going to find out what I was looking for. This thing was fixing to pay off. When I finished it, Nothing happened. Not a damn thing. <laughs> Shit. Uh, so, I kept waiting for something to happen. And nothing was happening. One day turned into two and three and then a week passed and then a month. I had a talk with God. I said, all right now, I've given you my best and this must have, must have not been enough. So show me another course so I can get it to you. I'll, I'll do whatever it takes. You already know that. No answer. No comfort. Nothing. Not a word. Well, another month passed, and I waited in a dry and dusty wasteland with no reason to hope I'd ever know my relationship with God. I hadn't given up, but I was plumb out of ideas. Then one day, I was driving home to West Tennessee, which is about 150 miles west of Nashville on a Sunday afternoon after playing the park. Just going down the interstate as usual, not thinking about anything in particular. And I just kind of looked up to the, my right at the pine trees on the side of the road. And all of a sudden, the pine needles had light around them, just for a second. Now afterwards, I remembered the Course in Miracles mentioned in light episodes. It said when you have these light episodes, true vision wouldn't be far behind. And it was right, because just as soon as the light around those pine needles disappeared, snap. I had a shift in consciousness to where I was able to recognize my identity refle reflected back to me from those pine trees. My identity was the same identity as those pine trees. What? <laughs> Wait a minute. I've always seen this with things and just hadn't been conscious of it. Although... I have always been conscious of it in some way. I just wasn't conscious of being conscious of it. <laughs> this isn't new, but it is definitely a fact. How could I have missed this? Then I looked off to my left and saw a hawk perched on an old dead's nag there. And same thing. My identity was reflected back from the hawk and the dead snag. I was amazed that my identity could be reflected back from something dead like a, like an old snag, you know. And uh, it was beyond life and death. It was the same everywhere I looked. It was in the license plate numbers on the car in front of me. It was in all the different colors of the cars that went by. In the white lines on the interstate. In the asphalt. Same. Everywhere I looked, I recognized my identity in everything. What a wonder. Then there was a voice that rose up inside me and said in almost an audible tone, This is it. I had found God, and God wasn't a he, a she, or an it. God was my very identity, and that identity was in everything as everything. Wow, <laughs> I don't even know what it is, but it's me, and there's no doubt about it. 
I see me everywhere. I immediately realized that there had never been a moment that I was not conscious of this identity. I had always seen it in everything and just hadn't recognized it. It had been there all the time, but just now I was really conscious of it. I immediately became aware of understanding what Jesus was talking about when he said, Before Abraham was, I am, because my identity transcended time. There was no time about it. I also knew what he meant when he said, Beware, for I come like a thief in the night. Yes, yes, this was sudden and unexpected. This recognition was immediate and final. I had finally found God. Turns out, God is my identity, and the identity of everyone and everything. I also remember the saying of Jesus, I come not into the world to condemn it, but that it might be saved through me. I understood that. That through me, the world had just been saved. All of it. Because my identity is spotless and clear and without taint of any kind. And everything is that spotless and taintless identity. Amazing, but so matter-of-fact, so final, and so all-inclusive. There was just no way possible that I could put any words to this. I didn't even want to tell anybody about it. What was I going to say? God is my identity, and I am his, and he ain't a he? <laughs> no way think I'll just keep this to myself. I'd never even heard of such a thing being possible. But I was seeing exactly what Jesus was talking about in my own unique way. And later come, came to find, when I read about the Buddha, this is what he recognized in the morning star. I had recognized in the pine trees what Buddha had recognized in the morning star. That's pretty cool. This is what he was talking about when he said, I gained absolutely nothing from unexcelled enlightenment. Of course he'd say that, because like me, he had been seeing it his whole life without recognizing it. In that moment, I could say without a doubt, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I could also say, I am the light of the world. But it was so ordinary, so obvious. I couldn't believe I hadn't grasped this when it had been so out in the open and available right from the very beginning. The jubilation of recognizing this didn't last for long, not for long at all. After I sat with it for a while, I was dumbfounded and disturbed. I mean really disturbed. I'd lost my friend and guide. I'd realized there wasn't a God that I could pray to anymore. We had merged into a singular identity to where there was no difference. This was a bummer. All there was now was my stark identity reflected back to me through all the senses. My identity was in everything I saw, tasted, heard, smelled, touched, and thought. There was no denying it. It was self-evident in everything and everywhere, and it was without shape or form or comfort. It is stark immediacy, just me, identity without an identity. I found myself, along with everything else, to be authoritative immediacy, and that was it. It's not even void. I later found it to be the identity of voidness. So this was found to be even more transcendent than voidness. There was no love, peace, joy, or bliss with it. Bummer. Just stark immediacy. I found it to be extinct of any quality. The identity of all qualities without itself being a quality. You see, if I felt any feeling of any kind, it was my identity that I was feeling. I mean, the identity of that feeling. No matter if it was relative peace, love, bliss, hate, or any experience, my identity 
was the identity of every experience, and there was no relief in knowing this. Identity didn't offer any relief. My identity is the quintessence of disturbance as well as peace. Makes no difference the quality of any experience. I am the identity of that experience. If I had experienced any relief, I could recognize the experience of relief to be an illusory experience because my identity was what every condition and experience really was. And my identity was not a condition of any kind. Although the recognition of this authoritative identity was definitely an experience. Identity itself, though, was not an experience. I was experiencing this angle of perception without being different from it. The me idea didn't go away. It just got jolted into recognizing its true quintessence to be stark identity that was reflected back to me from everything. Talking about a marvel, a terribly disturbing marvel this was. Since I still felt disturbed, I thought I'd missed something along the way because I seem to be worse off now than I had been before I'd had the perceptive shift. I was confused and confounded by finding myself to be stark immediacy with no juice. I remembered that not only could I not die, but that I'd never been alive either. This identity wasn't alive or never had been. It transcended life. What was the juice, the peace, the love, and the joy that they sang about in church? I'm not feeling it. <laughs> Glass breaking immediacy don't feel like anything but me, and I can't find myself to be anything knowable, but I remain. So I decided to do the Course in Miracles again, thinking I would come clear on my confusing state. I spent the next year going through the course all over again, line by line, day after day. When I finished it the second time, nothing. So I decided to go through it a third time. About a week into the third time, I got a strong message from within that I needed to quit on it. I was, it was beginning to drive me nuts. And I was already crazy enough, so I put it down. I couldn't make heads or tails of my discovery. It had no use. It was just stark fact with no utility. I had several more shifts to come. What I had recognized was the crown jewel for sure, but there had to be several more perceptive shifts to come before I could have any satisfaction with it. I went through a long and arduous acclimation period with this first particular shift. After being amused, disturbed, and puzzled by this recognition for a year or so, I met someone in the music business who'd been tinkering around with self-recognition for several years, and he was an invaluable find for me because he knew about some good books out there on the subject. I shared my experience with him, and he told me that I had found what everybody was looking for. So he gave me three really good books that helped me, and uh, they helped me get some kind of conceptual grasp of what I had discovered. One of the books was the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas. On the very first page, I read these words. Jesus said, Let him who seeks continue seeking until he finds. When he finds, he will be troubled. When he becomes troubled, he'll be astonished. And he will reign over the all. Now, that hit a nerve for me. I went, yep. That's exactly what's happened in my case, for the most part. I had continued seeking until I found... And I had found, and I was troubled. 
and I had become astonished. And now that's all that's left is I'm going to, I got to find out how to rule over the all. Now, notice this verse didn't say rule over all. It said rule over the all. There is a big, big difference. I didn't understand at the time, but now I do. What is the all? The all is absolute consciousness. I knew that I was the identity of the all, but I had another shift coming. So now, all I had to do was get on to this all, because I had already found my identity to be that which is the absolute identity of everything. The other two books my friend gave me were the words of two great masters. One one of the books was uh, I Am That by Nisargadatta Maharaj. And the other book was uh, Talks with Ramana Maharshi. As I found my way with what I now refer to as absolute consciousness, these two fellas described it as good as I've ever read or heard it spoken. They were uh, seasoned masters of Advaita Vedanta, or non-duality, which I ended up finding to be the all mentioned in the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas. But before I got on to absolute consciousness, I had another major shift, and a beneficial shift that would help me with the apprehension of the paradoxical absolute consciousness and make it more available. This shift was the shift of time and the eternal. This was a biggie, a great window into discovering non-duality. Discovering eternity turns out to be a most visceral way to experience absolute consciousness. I have only had one person I've pointed the now out to to where they actually really got what I was pointing at. Uh, you know, comprehending the eternal now is a simple feat. Uh, apprehending it takes an intuitive shift in perception. I'll explain in the way I pointed it out to my friend Todd. He plays the bass with me in my band, and we were riding down the road going to a gig one day, and I thought I'd have a little fun with him, as we were obviously talking about time in some way or another, like what time it would be when we got back home that night or something of that nature. I said, you know, there really is no such thing as time, Todd. And of course, he said, what are you talking about? I said, well, I'll show you. Without looking at your watch, tell me what time it is. And he made some generalization. I said, see, you don't know what time it is, do you? And uh, he said, well, let me look at my watch and I'll tell you. So he looked at his watch. I said, uh, can you tell me what time it is? And he said, with confidence whatever time he was reading there at the moment. I said, well, wait a minute. What about that second hand? I said, uh, it's moving while you're talking. You, you're, you're getting behind. You may try to lead the second hand, but you're still going to be behind. I said, if you break time down into seconds and then tenths of a second and hundreds and thousands of a second, the numbers are going to be moving by so fast that you can't read them, much less try to lead them enough to give me a correct time. So, I said, you can't even think or know what time it is, let alone speak it. And he said, you're right. Okay, I said, tell me what now it is. And as everyone does when you ask that question, he got that deer in the headlight look in his eyes and said, what now is it? I said, yeah, not a trick question. What now is it? He said, well, hell, it's now, of course. I said, yeah, you see, this now don't ever change or move. This is the same now you were born in, 
lived your life in up to this point and will die in. This is the now before there ever was a universe. And it will remain to be the now, the same one, when there is no universe. So we still use time as a useful instrument of measurement, but it's nothing more than an idea. The truth of the matter is that it's always now, period. And he said, yeah, that makes sense. I understand that. And then he turned his head and looked out the window as if to let me know the conversation had come to an end. And uh, I thought to myself, yeah, you comprehended the eternal now, but you hadn't apprehended it yet. You're, just, you're hearing the notes, but you ain't hearing the music. And we left it at that. About a month later, I, I got a call from Todd one Sunday afternoon. And uh, j just after I said hello, he was screaming in the phone, There ain't no fucking time! <laughs> it's always now! It's so simple and obvious, he said. He said, I just sitting out here on the back porch smoking a cigarette, not even thinking about it, and it just clicked. There's only now. Ain't never been anything else. Well, we had a good laugh, and that's the last time I've heard him mention it. I play music at the Opry with old Todd most every weekend, and his now Satori moment, it happened a couple of years ago, and I don't reckon it meant a thing to him. <laughs> this is a good example of why I don't teach. It means nothing to those who have had it pointed out to them who are not interested in recognizing their most essential nature. Uh, if any recognition is, isn't applicable to one's everyday life, one will soon forget about it. I can't express how valuable it was to me, in, in my case, to recognize this eternal, changeless immediacy we call now. This recognition for me came suddenly and was final. Wow, this is the moment that forever is. And it's too immediate to even measure. Yet it's everlasting. <laughs> what a paradox. I had previously had the idea of eternity being endless time, but was joyfully shocked to find there never was any time, that eternity is timeless. As I told Todd, Time is a very useful tool, and I use it every day, but it just ain't so. It's only an idea. But the eternal now is not a concept. It's a rock-solid, visceral fact that is self-evident. And I came to find this visceral sense to be absolute consciousness. So... I ended up putting this paradox to work in the doer absolute consciousness paradigm. The doer is like time. The doer is a useful tool of apparent separation and individuality, but it's a fiction. For what the doer really is, is absolute consciousness. Just as time is really the eternal now. This was a profound discovery for me. I could definitely see that time and my doer idea were fictitious, but were very useful and were not to be done away with. After discovering this, I woke up one morning with the cross on my mind. I recognized the cross was a useful metaphor for time and the doer idea as the horizontal beam, and the eternal and absolute consciousness were the vertical beam. I sensed that there were there where the vertical and horizontal met or crossed, that would be where I would someday be able to consciously live, to where the relative and absolute were the same. I already understood this great paradox, but I wasn't a feeling it yet. I understood that the doer and absolute consciousness were one and the same, but I hadn't yet had the shift to where it was a physical or viscerally felt moment-to-moment -moment experience. I was still hanging out in the dry and dusty desert for some more dark, dreadful, and oppressive 
self-inflicted ass whippings for years to come. <laughs> Crawling through hell. The next several years, I got to crawl through the belly of hell and meet death face to face. Out of the blue, I started feeling like I was dying. Shortly after that, I started having periodic episodes of panic attacks. Then the panic attacks picked up in frequency and intensity as time went along. This was a long trick. The panic attacks gradually picked up steam over the next 11 years until they reached a point to where I really didn't think I was going to make it. I felt like the jig was up. I was having them every few minutes. Now, I'd like to say something about these panic attacks right up front. My younger brother had them too, and he wouldn't give you two cents for self-recognition. It just so happened that these coincided with this particular part of my search where the existential death experience was imminent. I was watching a TV program, and uh, a commercial came on about a course that I could buy that had to do with eradicating anxiety. Well, I wrote the number down, called them up, and they said the course was $500, and I could get my money back if I wasn't satisfied, so I ordered it. When it arrived, I opened it up and saw it as it was a pretty comprehensive course, but it had a CD on the front page with people giving testimonials of their symptoms with panic attacks. So I sat down and listened to the CD and listened to these folks describe my symptoms to a T. Then a doctor came on and said no one had ever died from a panic attack that they knew of. <laughs> I had a good laugh and I put the CD back in the cover and I took the whole course and put it on a shelf upstairs, and I hadn't looked at it since. I didn't ask for my money back. I figured I got my $500 worth. I remember that company doing a follow-up call after about a month passed after I received it, and this young fella came on the phone there on the other end and said, uh, how you doing with your panic attacks? And Oh, I told him, oh, I'm, I'm great. He said, well, have you gotten over the panic attacks? And I told him, no, I'm just not afraid of them now. And he hung up, and I ain't heard from him since. Knowing that panic attacks wouldn't kill me didn't curb them, though. They only got worse and more intense. I had somewhere along the way read or heard about the dark night of the soul, and I just figured that what I was going through. I thought, damn, this dark night is sure the long one for me. It started with fear when I was 16 years old, and now I'm in my late 40s, and it's still amping up to where I'm in almost constant communion with death. I thought I was going crazy along with feeling like I was dying. I had to get on the stage and entertain people while having these panic attacks. <laughs> I wanted to run, but there was nowhere to run. I couldn't hide from myself. I got to wondering, when is this going to snap? Towards the end of the violent episodes with panic, these attacks got so debilitating that I finally went to see a doctor here in town. I told him I was having panic attacks, and he asked me what was causing them. And I wasn't about to try to explain to him so I just said, I don't know, but I need something to curb them. He gave me some Zoloft. It seemed to relieve them a little, but they wasn't getting rid of them, so I took a double dose of Zoloft to see if that would do the trick, and when I did, I got the panic attack from hell, the worst one yet. I felt like the jig was up. This is going to finish me off. So I called him back up, and I said, I feel like I'm going to die here in a few minutes. And uh, he said, well, let me call you in something else. So he called me in some Xanax, and I went over and managed to make it over to the drugstore. And I got them, and I took one. I felt like I had a condom over my whole being. The Xanax worked. It knocked the panic attack, but I couldn't 
couldn't go on feeling like I had a film over me. So I put the Xanax aside and decided to weather the storm without any help from the pharmaceutical companies. I'd already decided I was willing to die for this way back when I was at the age of 16 and I felt like I was being put to the test now. So I just backed my ears and went headlong into bearing the consequences. The shift of visceral absolute consciousness. Well, finally, in the year of 2008, I was driving to Nashville to do the Opry. I was in a particularly desperate state this day. I had been at this a long time now, and I'd, I'd reached a new depth of nowhere to turn. I felt like I was hemmed in with no way out. I'd given it my all, all my life, and I was destitute and broken. I had by now recognized absolute consciousness to conceptually be my beingness, and I knew it to be the beingness of all, and I understood the paradox of absolute consciousness, but was somehow not finished with it and was desperate to reach some finality with this suffering business. And while driving down the road for some unknown reason, I felt like a plug had been pulled from both of my feet, and all of my solidity and anxiety just emptied out. It was all just washed out. Finally, I got to feel the ecstasy of actually being the vacuous, absolute consciousness that I had understood conceptually for decades. Ah, finally, I knew I could never feel solid again as I once had. This was a new day. The panic attacks were mortally wounded in that moment. They'd still come around to visit, but were they were now on their way out. They got weaker and weaker with less frequency until they finally subsided. I felt the desperate existential seeking take a mortal blow too. <laughs> there were a few loose ends that needed to be tied up and quite a bit of acclimation ahead, but I was no longer in an existential crisis. I felt I was finally over the hump. Now the next step was to get acclimated with all these things that I've discovered. I was loaded for bear now I was ready to start really living this. I soon found out that the acclimation process wasn't going to be any quick and easy venture. Getting acclimated with the recognition of absolute identity was no walk in the park, and unity consciousness wasn't going to be a quick either. I had an unruly doer idea to deal with. Not only was the doer sense not willing to go along easily, but the ravaged physical body and whirling intellect were a few more years away from accepting these shifts in perception. I had to wait it out, like I'd been doing all the way, and let things shift into place naturally. Not even now, with my understanding and intuitive shifts in perception, could I rush or push this along? I was like a new and clear distilled alcohol poured into a barrel to age into whiskey, and there just ain't no rushing it. The last shift in perception that I've had up to this point has been something that I had read about and felt like I really understood conceptually for a long time. It's not different from the time eternal recognition. Not all that different anyway, but it's another way of experience and application of that shift. The way I read it is a Chinese term, Wei Wu Wei. The definition of the term, as I understand it, is action which is non-action. And I felt I really understood this paradox about absolute consciousness before I got the visceral experience of it. But now, 
I found this to really have utility. This is the only shift I've had along the way that wasn't a jolt. I guess it wasn't a jolt because it's so similar to the time eternal shift. I don't even know when this one happened. I just found it to be so one day. I found that I was walking without walking, breathing without breathing, moving around while perfectly still. That's the state of affairs now. <laughs> of course, it's not anything new. It's always been that way. Only now I'm just aware of it. It's the paradox of absolute consciousness. I'm stiller than still, no matter if I'm moving around or not. This is very cool and most natural. Cool is a good word to describe this because this experience doesn't have the heat of desperation about it. It's just a natural fact. It's being without being, talking without talking, thinking without thinking, spontaneous and without intention. If there is effort, there's not effort right there with it. No distinction to be made. I read this sentence one day, and I knew from this particular angle of perception the meaning of this passage. Someone said, Buddha spoke for 50 years, and not a word passed his lips. <laughs> yes, that's it. Way, way, way. Action, which is non-action. It's a great line. I never was any good at stopping thoughts. I, I really tried. I got pretty good at it, I thought, at one time, but uh, just as soon as I'd let my guard down, all the thoughts that had been held at bay would come flooding in, and I recognized I had about as much chance of stopping thoughts as I would stopping the wind outside. So I totally failed at that venture. All the practices I've ever tried over the years were failures and this was one of them every one of them made me irritable and hard to be around it's a wonder i didn't alienate everyone i came into contact with with this last shift there is always absence of thought perfect stillness even if the thought process is running wide open perfect stillness with any motion just natural, unbroken stillness during any and every event. It's changeless and constant. But like all the rest of these shifts I've been speaking of, this eternal stillness has always been the case. Only now, I'm viscerally conscious of it. It's not new. Always been just as I found it. Right out in the wide open. This has been a great and useful find for me. This I find to be the peace beyond all understanding that I'd read about in the Bible 41 years earlier and the equanimity the great sages spoke about. Peace, finally. The peace of peace and the peace of war. Absolute peace. A me metaphorical way of putting this experience of peace that I'm talking about is like being at work by yourself in the kitchen doing whatever with several appliances running like the refrigerator dishwasher running radio playing on low and the air conditioner humming all of which you're not even giving any attention to they're just sounds going on a cacophony of sounds and all of a sudden, the electricity goes off. Ah, silence bursts forth and total relief from all that racket you didn't even recognize earlier that was going on has just stopped. Ah, just soothing and wonderful silence. Then you recognize this silence has always been the background of all sound. It's always been there, whether you're paying it any attention or not. It's absolute silence, absolute peace. For me, 
What a relief. <laughs> so, we're coming up on the end now. There's been an interfacing of the doer, absolute consciousness, and absolute identity as being my singular experience. The three angles of perception are always homogenized or interfaced, and there are really not three. In my case, it was needed to make these distinctions so that I could better understand myself. So that's my recount of the seeking and find adventure. I'm really right back where I started when I arrived in the baby bed and before. I wasn't born. I just showed up identifying with a body in an instant. All these discoveries I've made over the span of my lifetime, I already knew when I arrived. Only difference now as opposed to then, I'm now lucid. I'm consciously aware of them. But I haven't gained anything, for this is the way it was and is before I recognized it to be so. Nothing has fallen off or went away and never came back, as they say. Nor have I dropped into some void and am free-falling forever. Please don't buy that dramatic bullshit if you're trying to find your true nature. It just ain't so. Nothing goes away, nor do you fall into anything. What I've found doesn't go away. And the one that found it didn't go away. He only recognized he wasn't what he thought he was. What he was was the whole, the whole of it all, the whole time. And it hadn't been hidden. He had somewhere bought into a lie that took him some serious inquiry and some intuitive perceptual shifts to be corrected and to come to truth. So, what is it about you that is stiller than still, constant and unchanging? You know, the changeless don't change. Find the changeless in all change and the identity of that changelessness, and you found yourself. The most common question I've heard asked the few times I've talked to groups out in public is this, what happens to us when we die? And if that's your question, the most obvious answer to that question is to meet it with another question. What was happening to you just prior to becoming conscious. What were you doing just in the instant before you woke up in the baby bed? Find that out. If you contemplate that, I bet you'll come to the conclusion you were just fine and always have been and always will be. All this business of breaking the cycle of birth and death, that don't apply to me unless you mean finding out that I never have been born and never have died because I certainly never have been born, died, or even lived. These events or conditions don't apply to me. They are dreamy occurrences that magically appear somehow. Being associated with these dreamy events is also another magic trick. I don't even understand that. I don't understand magic. There's no telling how many apparent times I've consciously associated with different physical bodies and names that I claimed as my own. But it's been me every time. No telling how many dreamy lifetimes I've experienced. All I know is that I became lucid in this one. Am I through dreaming up lifetimes for myself? Shoot, I can't answer that. From my humanoid perspective, I can't imagine consciously retaining my natural state forever without finding it in the entertaining paradigm of duality. I wouldn't doubt I stick my head under the lawnmower again and again. <laughs> if so, I'll only be dreaming. Now, whether I'm going to be lucid in those dreams is to be seen. If I'm lucid, 
even that will be a phenomenal event, just as it is now, a mirage. So, bodies come and bodies go. Universes appear and disappear. I remain, whether I'm self-reflective or not, way woo way, appearing without appearing. What a marvel. Thanks for listening. See you later. And thank you, Mike Snyder, for taking time out of your day to make that recording for us. Really appreciate it. I just want to give you all a quick reminder. Support the TAT Foundation, Retreat Center Project. 23 days left until that fundraiser is over. Go to tatfoundation.org. Click the About button and then click the Homing Ground button and you'll see a donation button on that page. Please donate what you can. It's a great project, worthwhile. Your support is appreciated. Also, if you have any ideas for who to interview next or upcoming episodes, just let me know. Shoot those ideas to me. If you have a contact, that helps If you want me to interview Eckhart Tolle, for example, please send me his phone number. It will really expedite the process. Thanks a lot, and we will talk to you soon.